start recording. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Danny Shaw. Um, I'm your host today for the um, uh, UW Planville Engineering Seminar Series. The Engineering, engineering Seminar Series uh, is designed to invite speakers from the industry to show us uh, some real world projects, uh, what's going on behind the scene as an engineer. Uh, so we can learn not only uh, how the project is done, but also the, you know, why the de decision was, make, uh, was made and then you know, the challenges on the way during the design process. Uh, more importantly, we wanna showcase how important our work is to um, benefit the community we live in. So um, uh, today we're very happy to have our alumni, um, alumni, uh, Dr. Kevin Foyer um, coming zoom in from um, far east coast. Uh, he's right now physically on the east coast, but uh, uh, you know, thanks technology, uh, we are able to uh, have him and then give us this um, um, talk about I nine nine cradle cradle acid rock drainage remediation remediation project. Uh, so I will give a very quick introduction of the speaker, uh, Dr. Kevin Foy. How to pronounce your last name? It, it, it's Foy, so it, the E is silent, and it's, uh, it's yeah. Uh, he's, he's a cellular engineer and geotech engineering pro practice lead at uh, CTI and Associates, uh, where he works to address a variety of geotech geotechnical problems in solid waste and environmental remediation projects, uh, including municipal solid waste, uh, construction and demolition debris, uh, coal com combustion residues, hazardous waste, uh, no level radioactive waste and low level radioactive hazardous mixed waste facilities. Uh, he has consulted to projects in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Nevada, New Mexico, Washington, Texas. Oh, too long to pronounce everything. <laughs> Japan, Brazil, China, India. Uh, Dr. Foy uh, completed his PhD in civil engineering at Purdue University in 2005 uh, while researching reliability analysis for foundation and other geotechnical uh, structures. He has published more than 30 peer-reviewed publications on various geotechnical and geoenvironmental topics, and is currently serving as the secretary, secretary of the ASC Geo Institute uh, Geoenvironmental Committee and as associate editor for the Journal of Geotechnical and Geoenvironmental Engineering. Uh, Doug Foy was the lead engineer and project manager for CTI on this uh, project, I-99 Acid Rock Drainage Remediation Project. Uh, so again, thank you for uh, coming and sharing this project to us. So uh, please help me welcome our speaker. All right, Kevin. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. yep. We're good. And can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I apologize in advance. I seem to have come down with some kind of cold. So if um, if I'm difficult to understand at times, that's what's going on. I, I will try to compensate. Uh, I'll just say that um, I have a lot of slides to run through here. My main intent in putting uh, what is close to 120 different images in front of you today is to share a lot of photos of this project because it is uh, it's an extremely photogenic project and there's a lot to learn uh, in these images. So I, I hope to share a lot of that with you. So I will be moving quick at times. Uh, and the idea is to uh, give a flavor for the project and how uh, some of the, the things that we learn uh, in terms of the fundamentals of geotechnical engineering were really uh, important to bring to the fore in a project that was rather unusual. So a couple of firsts with this one. This is, to my knowledge, still the largest cable-supported GeoWeb uh, armor design in the world. It's about 1.4 million square feet of surface area that is covered, suspended entirely from the top. And uh, the reasons for why such a, a novel design was used in this, this situation has a lot to do with the, uh, the back and forth and the politics of the remediation of the site. And as I move through these photos, I'm going to share different parts of the project site so that you get a flavor for uh, how, how it got to be the way it is. So it's not going to be presented chronologically. I'm going to present this to you uh, sort of topically as we move from part to part of the site to see different aspects of the project. Uh, so with that, uh, there's three main areas that I'm going to talk about, the project background. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about design challenges. Actually, that, that part of this presentation is broken up in several pieces. And then uh, show a bunch of photos of what this looked like when it was actually being constructed. This is an older project, 
of mine. This was, uh, we started doing the engineering for this in 2006. We wrapped up construction near the end of 2009. Uh, the reason I picked this one to highlight to you today is that it is, is very unusual. You don't see a lot of projects like this and I think it is a good opportunity to share how, uh, how different things are, that you learn can be applied uh, in, in a strange novel circumstance. So where are we talking about? So put a star on the map uh, over Southwest Wisconsin. You can see the dot uh, over to the right is where State College Pennsylvania is located, if you're not aware. So uh, there's, there's quite a few lakes and mountains between here and there. Uh, Pennsylvania is a, a pretty uh, mountainous state in the middle, especially where we're talking about here at State College. So uh, this yellow splotch in the middle is where uh, the city of State College is located. And the, the I-99 corridor, which is all new interstate highway that was built in between basically 2003 and 2009, is a north-south interstate that connects uh, New York to the north and then some of the cities in southern Pennsylvania. As of uh, today, the interstate doesn't actually leave the state. So you could argue it's more of an interstate uh, highway, but uh, that, that is sort of tangential to the topic here. The section of highway that is relevant to what I'm going to be talking about is right here, uh, just north of the city where there's a mountain ridge. You can see from the way that the highways and the lines are oriented here, there are a number of uh, mountain ridges that uh, crisscross the state from southwest to northeast, and that's pertinent to what's going to be coming up. So here's a picture on the ground. Uh, this was a photo that was taken during the fall when I was out for one of my, my site visits, of which there were many during the early stages of construction. You can see it's a very scenic locale. Uh, these, these mountain ridges that we have here, you can see one of the distance. There's one that I'm standing on, are uh, basically these gently folded uh, limestone and shale dis deposits, mostly limestone. And in between them, you have uh, these little creeks and rivers that have formed uh, in the valleys in between. And just by virtue of being the East Coast mountains here, they've had lots and lots of time, geologically speaking, to erode over the years. Uh, lots of historical landslides that have occurred over the years. All of that is pertinent to what I will be talking about. Uh, here's a little impromptu aerial that I took out the window of the plane when flying back to Michigan for one of my site visits. And you can see that the bend in the new highway alignment right here uh, to, to get oriented. So I'm going to go back to this map. That is this bend right here. It goes over a couple of rivers, has some uh, bridges. So this is on the far western extent of the site. Most of the excitement for my project is happening further to the east where we actually travel through a road cut. And this is what that road cut looked like uh, during construction. So you could see that mountain ridge in the, the distance that I showed in that earlier photo. Here's the one in the foreground that the new I-99 alignment actually cut through. So history here, the, the intent was to have I-99 I travel north of State College uh, traverse one mountain valley to the next and then continue further north uh, in this particular location to make sure that the grade worked out properly for interstate highway alignment. That meant removing something like uh, 2 million tons of rock from this mountain ridge to create the road cut that would accommodate that, that highway. And so you can see what that looks like. At the time this aerial photo was taken, uh, pretty much all of the rock excavation had already taken place except for a little bit down here in the bottom of this valley. And uh, that rock had been distributed to different parts of the site. And that is relevant information for a problem I'm going to share in just a few minutes here. Uh, some other things to notice in this photo, you can see the alignment of an old state highway that crosses through the site. Uh, this is, was providing access to the other valley uh, for you know, many years prior to the construction of this project. And then also you could see this little area where there's some glossy black plastic showing that's actually a temporary cover for one of the spoil piles from the rock cut that uh, had to be covered for a reason I'm going to share in just a minute. So I'm going to zoom in on this next photo and I'm going to go right down here at the toe of this slope. Doesn't look at from this angle, this is a 330 foot long slope close to one horizontal to one vertical pitch. And at the bottom is where we expose some of this uh, limestone and it, it has some, some interesting things to, to show. So you can see kind of this blocky structure of the limestone. Uh, it's, you can't see the dip in this area, but it's actually dipping in the direction of uh, the highway, which is, is going to be relevant later. And you can see we have one of our, our geologists who's out to take a look at the site with us. He's got his rock hammer. Uh, geologists aren't happy without the rock hammer in the field, so I was happy to see that Steve had, had his with him. And what we were getting a close look at 
uh, wasn't related to what I was engineering, but is definitely related to why I was engineering. And that is this little gold sparkly bit of mineral here on that exposed limestone. This is iron pyrite, also known as fool's gold. And the thing that is relevant uh, environmentally about this material is that the way it's found in the ground in its unoxidized state, it's pretty stable, but as soon as you expose that to water and, uh, and air and oxygen, that it's going to uh, slowly convert into other sulfate uh, species, and then you get something like this. Uh, so here you can see this orange goo that's leaking out of the, uh, the rock face. They're getting hits on all kinds of different metals and things that have been dissolved by the acid drainage uh, because sulfate, uh, as it's dissolved, makes sulfuric acid. So it's, uh, it's very acidic. It's removing other metals from the rock. And that was showing up in groundwater samples. That was showing up in surface water samples. This was a, a big environmental problem. And, and the reason I bring this up is that the geotechnical investigations that were done at the beginning of the project were aimed at understanding the physical properties of the site uh, but what's completely overlooked was the presence of this rock. And you can see that, that that has a pretty severe consequence. So by the time 2003 rolls around, they start getting these hits and then the job is shut down. So at that point, uh, for those of you familiar with construction management, you know that this becomes a very expensive prospect. Contractors are idling, uh, you know, millions of dollars are being spent for people to stand around. Uh, it's it's a, a pretty big disaster for as far as the project is concerned at that point not to mention the, uh, the impacts to people's water. So the very first thing that was done was actually to uh, collect this water and to run it through pretreatment before it could be discharged to the, uh, the local waters. And that was an interim measure to make sure that at least while this was still draining, that there was, uh, there was a way to manage the water. It was not going to create uh, wider contamination. And as far as we could tell, that was largely successful. It involved uh, a number of underdrains, uh, surface water capture, and all of that was routed to a treatment pond. I'll have a picture of that in a minute. Also some other things that were tried during that time from 2003 to 2006 was some treatment studies to see if there are different chemicals that could be added to the, the rock uh, to stabilize it. A lot of that was not successful and ended up making a mess like this where you can see sort of the reddish orange goo coming out of the, the slope. Uh, so a lot of things were tried uh, sort of as a pilot to figure out what to do with this. And ultimately what uh, the, the owner, uh, Pennsylvania DOT decided to do is what I'm going to show you, which is to cover the entire site. So I mentioned I was going to show this. This is that treatment pond. You can see the, the captured water is actually running down this cascade to aerate it a little bit, goes into this, this four bay, and then there's some additives uh, added to basically flocculate out those different uh, contaminant species. And then when that's done, it goes into these big filter bags called geotubes. So basically a sewn up geotextile where uh, through the action of gravity and, and sometimes mechanical compaction, you get the, the clean water out, keep the flocculant in, and eventually all of these went to a landfill for final disposal. So this was going on for several years at the time that we got involved in the project, and that was the, the interim water treatment method. So here's a map of the site. And what I wanna point out on this slide is these different areas. We have this orange area here, this green area. It's about, uh, about five miles of alignment shown on this map. And these different highlighted areas, the green and the orange, are showing different places where either this iron pyrite bearing material was exposed as part of the rock cut, or alternatively, several places where that excess cut was placed as fill for the project. For those of you who have planned earthwork projects know that the ideal is to balance your cuts and fills so you're using the uh, earth materials that you're excavating elsewhere in the project. And this project is no exception. They tried to do that. Unfortunately, they found out after the fact that it was contaminated and it was causing a big problem. And so now you have several places around the site that are leaching this acid rock drainage. So that, that is a problem. Here's an aerial view of what is called the large cut and the small cut. These are two areas that I, I showed on that previous map. So this green area here is the large cut, the smaller green area is the small cut. These refer to places where the native rock was exposed for the road cut. And the, the other thing that you can see in this aerial photo are these temporary stockpiles right here. This one is covered in plastic and this one as well uh, to basically store that rock until it was determined what to do with it. The reason it's covered is because it was determined uh, in 2003 that it was leaching um, acid rock drainage. And at that point it was decided to put a PVC, so polyvinyl chloride 
a cap on it. So it's a very thin layer, about uh, 40 mil thick of plastic. So to put it in that perspective, that's 40 thousandths of an inch. So it would be like a, a very thick sheet of plastic uh, if you were thinking in terms of garbage bags, or it'd be like a very thin plate in terms of consistency. Reason PVC is used is it's very flexible and so it conforms nicely to the subgrade. You can see a little bit uh, in this picture where you, where you can see that temporary cover in the foreground. You can see the one up on top of the mountain there. And here's the, the large cut in the foreground before it was covered. Here's just driving along inside the large cut. So the original mountain ridge was up here where my mouse pointer is. Everything in this trapezoid shape was removed as part of that rock cut. Here's a view of the temporary cover on a small cap. Uh, same idea, just covering up that existing rock to, to try to mitigate the amount of storm water that's mingling with that iron pyrite. That's a, a little bit of an idea of what this, this area looks like. So I'm gonna switch over to large cut for a little bit here. Here's a picture uh, standing partway down the slope, get an idea of how steep it was. Uh, and so the idea for the remediation of this site is that everything that could be moved, they, they termed it movable material, things like this temporary stockpile, was going to be taken to a essentially a landfill disposal site on site that had a bottom liner system, leachate collection, final cover system, so that water can't get in and any water that is in is treated before discharge. So that was the solution for movable material. And then things like this rock slope, we're not going to remove the entire mountain, was going to be covered in place. That was termed the immovable material. So that, that is the solution that was agreed upon uh, between PennDOT and its uh, sister agency, uh, Pennsylvania DEP, Department of Environmental Protection. And uh, that decision was made in 2005 when we got involved in 2006. Uh, the, the ask of us from some subcontractors and some design engineers was how do we actually make that cover stay in place on the slope and how do we protect it from damage? So that was our, our mandate. So this next picture is just showing some of that movable activity going on. So this is uh, an excavator loading up some off-road dumps. You can see it traversing the unopened highway. And then this is that disposal cell that I had mentioned. So about, I wanna say just shy of 2 million tons of rock were destined for this site. It's built on at the toe of that mountain ridge. You can see that there's this little pristine uh, creek down here that is you know, what we're trying to protect with all of this work. And you can see over here where there's this, uh, this treatment pond that was using, is being used to treat leachate from the bottom of this, um, this disposal cell. So the idea is that any water that would fall on this, uh, this containment area when it rains would get collected at the low point that would be sent over here for treatment and then eventual discharge. So that, that is the strategy. Uh, you can see over here on the right where there is the, the first layer of the soil cover going down over top of the rock. And then eventually that was covered with a multi-layer synthetic cover, which is going to be very similar to what we designed for the immovable material. So here's just another view standing next to the highway, looking down into the disposal cell. You can see this shot that there's some geomembrane, which is a impermeable plastic, which is welded together using specialty equipment to create the impermeable barrier. And then what's yet to go on top of this is the drainage sand that is used to collect uh, any water that percolates through that waste rock and take it away for pretreatment. So just a picture of that in operation from right to left, you have the new cell being built. And on the, the left, you have the old cell that was built earlier that is currently being filled with rock. So that's where all those off-road dumps are going. So that was all over here uh, on the far Western extent of the site. Next, I'm gonna talk about what's going on over here with the so-called large buttress. This is a, a view of it before it was covered. And so all of this disturbed ground that you see here, it's kind of brown and green. This is what was called the large buttress. The reason a large buttress exists is that this side of the mountain ridge had been investigated previously by a geotechnical engineer. They, they did their tests, they, they did their uh, slope stability analyses and so on and determined that you know, it would be safe to cut the slope at roughly a two horizontal to one vertical slope. But what was not apparent to said consultant in the, in the boring logs and what came to light later is that the bedding planes of the limestone and shale in this area are actually all uh, directed into this cut. So where this rock was removed, all of that rock is basically teetering on this, this slope and it wants to fall in. So in the middle of construction, uh, before the acid rock drainage was discovered, this entire hillside was moving into the rock cut. And at that point, the decision was made to move all of the spoils from the large cut 
over here to construct the, the so-called buttress to stabilize that slope. And then not long after it was discovered that that material is contaminated. So why, why do I bring this up? I bring it up because there are many things happening at this project at the same time. You have transportation things going on, you have pavement things going on, you have geotechnical, geology, environmental, all of these things intersect on this project. And it's not good enough as a project engineer in the circumstance to say, well, I'm just gonna focus on my area of technical expertise. You need to have some peripheral awareness of things that are going on around you because it could very severely impact the project. Now, not suggesting that anyone practice outside their area of expertise. What I am suggesting is that you know the right people to call. And that was a big lesson learned from this project for everyone concerned. And starting out as an engineer, I just say that it's, uh, it's very easy to not know what you don't know. And so there's a lot to be gained earlier in your career from talking to a lot of different professionals and getting a sense for what they do. And that, that was a big lesson learned from this project. Uh, here's a view of that large buttress area before uh, we started building the cover. What I want you to notice is that it has these big blocky chunks of rock in it. It's not very conducive to putting our multi-layer barrier system on. So we're gonna talk about in a minute uh, what the implications of that are. Uh, but some people call this rainbow rock. You can see that it has sort of that orange and red coloration on it. That is that oxidizing pyrite expressing itself at the surface. Uh, so next we'll move over to structure 317. So this highway alignment moves from mountain ridge to valley where State College is. State College is over here on the right. And as you're moving down, you want to have this gradual grade on your interstate highway. And to facilitate that, there are these, these bridges and this large embankment here to sort of ease that transition. I'm sure in southwestern Wisconsin, you've seen lots of examples of that. Uh, this is no different. The problem is, of course, that all of this fill was constructed from those spoils. That, that's a, a recurring theme in this discussion. Uh, but by the time it was discovered, they already had the bridge on it. And uh, PennDOT was loath to you know, demolish this perfectly pristine uh, bridge that they had just built. You know, there's two bridges here, there's two bridges on the other side, they wanted to keep the structures. And so that was part of the motivation to cover these things in place. Uh, whether they ultimately saved any money that way or not, I, I don't actually know, uh, but certainly it was not a, a no brainer you know, to, to build this cover because it does come with its own host of problems. You could just see an area where you can see that that same rainbow rock here, it's a little bit smaller pieces exposed to the surface. And uh, here's what that, that outside slope looked like. You can see some bare patches, uh, other places where the gas has grown in. And then you can see this little culvert where the, the creek goes through. So this is very close to where we're gonna have our orange goo discharging directly to the, the surface water. So not a great situation environmentally. And this is another view looking at the, uh, the structure 317 area from on top of the large cut, just to give you an idea of the magnitude of this area. So the solution would be to cover all of this embankment uh, that you can see there, you got some off-road trucks uh, for scale. So it's, it's uh, not a trivial sized area. So what are we trying to do with the immovable material? Uh, as I mentioned, the solution is to put an impermeable cover to keep that uh, rainwater and oxygen off of the rock so it stops oxidizing. And once we put that cover in place, we need to have a way to protect it so it continues to function. That's our second objective. And then finally, PennDOT likes to have uh, their nice finished uh, rock aggregate surfaces on everything. We need to be able to construct that as well. So we're going to do that. So I'm going to show a real quick succession here for the large buttress, what things looked like before, during, and after cover construction to get you some uh, perspective on that. So again, you can see that rainbow rock at the surface and that large buttress area. You can see the natural slope up here. And then uh, in the middle of the project, we're constructing our impermeable barrier, which consists of this uh, high density polyethylene or plastic uh, geomembrane, which is that uh, prevents the water from CP dense being seamed together when the shot was taken. And then uh, in its final configuration, we have either a grass slope or this uh, Astro 57, so three quarter inch nominal stone, uh, which is filling in to create that, that final appearance. So this is what we want it to look like. Problem statement posed to us is how do we get there? Uh, so here's, here's the challenge. So number one, we have to deal with that blocky rock surface. How do we put our, our delicate geomembrane on top of that? Next, how do we actually put a geomembrane on top of that slope since it's very steep? And then also because of that steepness, what do we do to armor that geomembrane in place so it doesn't get damaged by flying debris vehicles and so on? And then how do we hold all of that material in place or cover support? 
So uh, my boss, Tiag, he said that this is kind of like a geotechnical playground for me at the time, and he wasn't wrong. Uh, we, we brought a lot of different um, ideas to bear on these problems. And what I'm gonna do in the next uh, series of photos is kind of run you through different solutions that were used to achieve those objectives in different places. So here we are in the large buttress. You can see that rainbow rock in the foreground. On the right, you could see a smoother surface. And what was happening here, uh, this slope is roughly two horizontal, one vertical is shallow enough that actually an excavator was able to traverse it more or less safely. I, I don't want to opine a whole lot on what I thought about that. Needless to say, it is a, a little alarming to see an excavator on a two to one slope from this angle. Uh, but to my knowledge, they, they did not have any problems with that. But what they're doing is actually uh, moving that blocky material around and in some cases actually bringing in some finer grain fill to smooth it out and infill around those large blocky pieces to dress up the slope as you see on the left, which is gonna be suitable for geomembrane placement. Uh, easier said than done on the large cut, which is shown in this photo, uh, we have a mix of loose rock and then also rock outcrops, the native rock uh, that we dug into itself that are expressing as different shelves in the surface of this, this rock cut. And so several different things were tried. Uh, you can see here's what the surface looks like kind of in the middle of the work. And uh, here's a little bit closer view to give you a better appreciation for what that blocky structure looked like. So here's one of those shelves of the native rock sticking out and then here's some loose rock that's falling down. Uh, they tried you know, this drag line. You can see the cable there. They're trying to knock down some of the loose rock. Uh, we actually went out at one point and we laser scanned the entire surface to try to figure out where all the rock protrusions are. We mapped and figured out where high points and low points are to, try to give some direction to the contractor when it can smooth. Uh, here you can see you know, very prominently a, a couple of those rock shelves expressing again. Uh, so it's, it's just a really big challenge. Ultimately what they ended up doing is taking this little excavator here known as a spider on account of its legs. And it was uh, basically secured uh, for safety purposes by a steel cable that went up to the surface and was anchored at a, at a bulldozer at the crest of the slope. And the, this spider would traverse up and down the slope and would knock down the loose parts and fill in the, uh, the low points to create that smooth surface. And this was sort of a painstaking process, but ultimately was, uh, was the only way the contractor really could figure out how to do that. Uh, so that, that is a picture of that in progress. Uh, other things that were done, this is a picture of the uh, small cut area. You could see that this is where the temporary cover is located. You can see these protrusions sticking up through it. We actually went over this with several layers of a very thick non-woven geotextile. Non-woven geotextiles, for folks who haven't seen them, are like a really thick felt. It's a plastic felt. And that would cushion these little protrusions so that they would be less likely to poke up through our geomembrane. Uh, here you can see a view from the top, kind of in the middle of this, uh, this activity of smoothing off the surface. And uh, this is what it looked like when it was all done. And uh, in the case of this you know, opposing side of the large cut, actually a decision was made to dig out a fair amount of that material, just make, uh, take it over to the, the disposal area because it was decided that this wasn't holding anything up and therefore was more properly turned movable. Uh, and that actually reduced the, the amount of difficulty of engineering that area, uh, but not possible to do that everywhere. So once the subsurface was taken care of, uh, next thing is, well, how do we put the geomembrane in place? And so here we are, structure 317. You can see that that bottom cushion geotextile going down. And then over top of this is where our geomembrane layer goes. And this is a picture from uh, the large buttress where that's happening. So we have our uh, prepared subgrade on the left, geotextile here in the middle, and then the shinier uh, black plastic right here. This is our geomembrane that's being deployed. So you're going from subgrade to barrier layer from left to right. Uh, this is the same perspective on the large cut. Uh, for uh, scale here, you can see there's some workers that are standing here at the toe of slope. You can see there's a worker here uh, working on the face of the slope. As we go from right to left in this picture, we have the prepared subgrade. We have this duller uh, geotextile, that, that uh, thick felt essentially that's going down as a cushion. We have our geomembrane here, which is the shinier area. And then we have our top cushion, which is the geotextile. The reason behind the, the top cushion is the very same as the bottom. When we put that uh, 57 stone that I mentioned earlier on top of this barrier layer, we wanna make sure that those rocks are not protruding down into our geomembrane. So this top cushion is also functioning as uh, a protection to that geomembrane. Uh, so I'm gonna zoom in a little closer here. You can see some workers working. This is on the large buttress where it's a little bit shallower. 
Uh, they're actually using cables to pull the geomembrane down and it's being deployed from the top. As those come off of big rolls uh, like toilet paper, those geomembrane rolls weigh you know thousands of pounds a piece. So you can't you can't move the whole roll around by hand, but as you unroll it, you can actually pull it into place. Uh, especially if you have an assistance with uh, either a uh, a winch or a, a number of workers, you can pull that into place. That's what we're seeing here. It's actually being overlapped uh, just prior to seaming. Uh, this is a uh, so-called mouse. It's a, a motorized track welder. It actually uh, takes those two halves of that geomembrane where the panels overlap and then uh, welds them together. It's a fusion welding process where it melts both sides and, and welds it together. Uh, this is a air channel testing, which is a quality assurance uh, technique that we use on geomembrane seeds. So the idea with this is that there's a little air channel that's created by that welder. We pressurize it and we measure to see once it's pressurized, if there's any drop in pressure. If we don't see a drop in pressure, that means that that channel is contiguous, which doesn't tell you how strong it is, but it does tell you whether or not the weld was completed from end to end. So it's a, it's a so-called continuity check. Uh, here's some extrusion welding going on. We use this a lot where we have penetration. So I'll talk in a minute what these H piles are doing there, but uh, needless to say, we wanted to make sure that it was watertight around those. And so there's a, a penetration. We have this little patch that goes around that penetration. And that patch is secured uh, watertight to the, the geomembrane using uh, extrusion welding, which is putting a bead of molten uh, high density polyethylene around that to secure it together. And then you can see in this picture uh, where there's a penetration, where there's a monitoring weld casing, you can see it's soapy. That soap is from the so-called vacuum box testing where we, we put soapy water down and we put a vacuum on this clear uh, gasketed box to see if any bubbles come up. If there's bubbles, that means that air is able to travel through the seam from the bottom, which means there's a gap somewhere. So this is another quality control technique to test for uh, continuity of the seam. Something we do all the time in landfill engineering, not something you typically see in a highway site. So there was a lot of education to bring uh, the folks at PennDOT up to speed on why this was important, why we were doing it. And all of this boils down to making sure that that impermeable barrier layer does in fact keep the water out, which is the whole point of this exercise. Some other penetrations, there's a stormwater drains out there. Here you can see there's a boot. So there's a, another kind of patch for this uh, penetration. This is one of the under drains that manages the iron pyrite runoff, the acid rock drainage from underneath the geomembrane that's still gonna be collected and treated, but that attenuates over time as less and less water finds its way into the site. So here's a picture of the large buttress. So it's partially covered. You can see our geomembrane here. You can see our geotextile at the bottom. And then we went through winter season. We came back and we finished it. This aerial photo was taken uh, in the spring when uh, the contractor has finished up the construction of that cover. And uh, that, that is the general sequence with the barrier layer. So let's talk about protective layer for a moment. So the idea when we're all done is we want to have this nice stone surface so that when you know truck tires blow up and go flying off the road or uh, debris gets kicked off the highway and flies into the slope, that it's not going to puncture that geomembrane. And so for that, we have a relatively thin layer of that 57 limestone rock, about four inches thick of that three inch quarter, uh, or sorry, three quarter inch nominal stone that goes into, or goes onto the slope. But the question is, how do you keep it there? Or alternatively, uh, for this vegetated soil, it's also similarly thin layer of soil that goes over our barrier layer. How do we hold that in place? And what we're trying to avoid is something like this, right? Where it rains and it uh, washes out our cover uh, from on top of our barrier layers. You see the barrier underneath, see the, the grass and soil. We, we don't want this to happen. So how do we make sure that doesn't happen? Uh, two different strategies were used. The first, and this was used everywhere, is to have uh, this erosion control product is called a geocell, which is this expanded plastic mesh four inches deep that is used to hold all of the stone and, or soil in place on the slope. It has hoil, holes in it so that water can move through it. Uh, and then in the case of this picture actually is a geogrid underneath to provide that structural support. But the question is like, how do we make sure that the stone that's inside this geocell stays where it's supposed to? So in some places we use these stainless steel cables with copper stops and a typical panel that measured 17 feet long and seven feet wide might have something like 50 of these stops in it to provide the mechanical connection between this expanded plastic geocell and the, the stainless steel cable. In other words, gravity is trying to pull the rock down, GeoWeb resists that, the GeoWeb transfers that force to this stop sleeve, which transfers the force to the, the stainless steel cable. 
stainless steel cable has many, many, many of those stop sleeves. You can see markings where they go. You can see it laid out where they put like a big ruler on the highway to measure where all of those sleeves need to go. Here you can see that they are crimping those stop sleeves in place. This is the specialty contractor that we were working with, uh, uh, Setco Contracting. Here's the, the hydraulic crimper tool that they use to crimp those copper stop sleeves in place. Here you can see them working. And so every one of those 17 foot long panels would have dozens of these that had to be crimped on. And so, as you can imagine, that was a real production to cover 1.4 million square feet. So they worked uh, for two years putting all of this together. Here you can see those panels being deployed. So once the cable is strung through all of that geocell, it basically makes one long seven foot wide curtain. Those are winched up the hill into place once they're assembled. And if you look closely, you can see that those cables that are holding everything up are actually visible as these light colored striations in the geocell. And of course, we have the regular pattern of the geocell here. The panels edge to edge are connected with zip ties and the structural support is provided by those stainless steel cables. So here's, here's that view where we have the uh, geotextile in place. Here you can see they're pulling that geocell. Here's the geocell that's been pulled up into place on the slope. And again, you can see those uh, light colored cables that are running through the geocell. So that was one strategy. Uh, other strategy was to put geogrid underneath the geocell. And so the, the idea here is a little different. So instead of having the load transfer through the geocell to the cables, now we have the act of the stone trying to slide down the hill against this geogrid uh, being uh, held in place by the grid. So it's a frictional interface at the bottom. Uh, the stone wants to slide over the grid, the grid won't let it. And so that is what we use to hold it in place. Because of the kinds of forces involved with the longer slopes, the geogrid wasn't really viable for our taller slopes, but it was perfectly fine for some of our shorter slopes, which uh, includes this area. This was a T54 area. Here's a view of what that looked like going in the top of the median. Uh, so you could see this our anchor zone where it's flat. A few more words on that in a minute. And you can see the slope here onto the right. And then here's a close-up view of what that looked like when it was all stacked together. So our barrier is hidden underneath. We have our geogrid, which is providing our structural support. We have our geocell, which is providing our erosion control. And then we have that uh, three quarter inch nominal stone, that, uh, that crushed aggregate that is going in the geocell that is interlocked. You can see where it all spills in around the geogrid underneath to hold everything together. So that's what the, the complete sandwich looks like. All right, so how do we hold all of that in place? So this is our next challenge, the cover support. How do we hold our protective layer up? So we use several different technologies across the site. One is a dead man acre. So in this case, we have our stainless steel cables that come up to the top of the slope. They turn over the crest and are terminated with a mechanical connection in a big concrete block. So what does that look like? It looks like this. You can see our concrete block was cast in place on top of this uh, protective aggregate layer that goes over top of the geomembrane. So in landfill engineering, it's very common to construct uh, different structures on top of geosynthetics. It's, it can be done. What you need to do is provide sufficient um, isolation in the form of sand or stone so that you're not uh, puncturing that. So this is an example of, of what that would look like. And then you can see around the concrete anchor, you can see the different uh, stone that is being used to provide this, uh, this passive earth support to prevent the, the concrete anchor from moving. So in other words, when we load up that uh, cable on the face with that three quarter inch stone. It's going to tension the cable. The cable is going to pull on the concrete block and the concrete block is going to be prevented from moving through a combination of friction at the bottom and soil that is pinning it in place from the front. And so the challenge here is to do almost like a backwards retaining wall analysis, which is something you might learn in your geotech classes to figure out just how much soil and how much uh, concrete is needed to provide that lateral support. So again, something we're going back to the fundamentals is very helpful in a novel design circumstance. Uh, here you can see the forming up the concrete block. You can see the, the internal reinforcement where mechanical connectors are. Uh, you can see that using this crane to place the concrete. So the concrete trucks line up here. They put it in the bucket in place from the top. Uh, finished anchor, cables hooked up with their mechanical connection, and then turning that corner over the top onto the face. So that was the sequence of work there. So what, what's different with the geogrid? The difference is our anchorage now is not provided by concrete. Our anchorage is being provided by is backfill. So the idea is we're providing enough weight on top of the geogrid that's essentially pinched in place and can't slide down the slope. Again, this is a classic uh, pullout analysis that we learned in some of our geosynthetic design courses. 
And so again, a good application of the fundamentals. This is what the whole anchor cross section looks like being constructed. So we've got that uh, protective stone layer on the bottom that provides that bottom interlock with the grid, grid going over the top, our geocell, and our backfill soil, which is providing the weight to hold that geo grid in place. And again, you can see compared to the other slopes, a very uh, shallow slope. So we don't need to have uh, a massive anchor to hold this material in place. So just another picture of that construction in progress. Here you can see the, the, the leading edge of that anchorage zone, and then here's the, the slope, and then the finished product. Uh, other places, we, we shook it up, so there were several places on the site where actually there wasn't enough room for a concrete anchor uh, to resist sliding by gravity, and so we, we used this strategy where we use a laterally loaded uh, pile with a steel beam behind it, which is bearing against the, the uh, beams. So this would be very similar to the kind of design process that you would go through for designing a, uh, a, a soldier pile and lagging wall, just that instead of having soldier pile and lagging, you have these isolated uh, steel piles that are providing the lateral support to this beam. So very similar math, just a novel um, application. I showed you that picture earlier with the penetrations. This is why they're there. So each of these piles are going about 30 feet to the ground, and they will have these uh, steel beams put behind them. So here's a picture of the beams. And uh, let me see. oh, I don't have a good shot of this. I'll show you another shot in a second where the, uh, the cables wrapped around it. But the idea is that those beams get placed behind the piles. We wrap the steel cables around it, and that the beam is not able to move it towards the face because it's held in place by these laterally loaded piles. Laterally loaded piles are not able to move because they're embedded in the soil and rock, uh, which is a classic uh, you know, uh, horizontal loading on a pile and uh, deformation analysis. We used uh, use kind of an uh, adjusted PY method for this, which I, I don't think is something you would encounter in undergrad uh, uh, pile analysis. It might be wrong, uh, but that is, is definitely a good thing to know in this circumstance because uh, that is where the entirety of our support is coming from. Here you can see that bench where the beam is going to go. Here's the beam. And then when it's all backfilled and grouted in place, this is what it looked like as a finished product. So uh, last technique to hold everything in place, instead of having the piles, we had a little bit more room to work with up on top of the large cut. And so we actually used a series of ground anchors, in this case, about 30 foot long rods that went back into the soil and rock, were grouted in place into the rock. And those resist the tension of the cables directly. So the cables turn the corner over the top of the slope. They're terminated around this beam. So the cable, as it's trying to pull down the slope, is pulling on the beam. The beam is pulling on the soil nails, which are these, these grouted steel rods in the ground. And those are resisting the movement uh, through their connection through that grout with the soil and rock. And so it's what exactly what it sounds like. We're resisting through pull out, meaning the forces that the soil and the grout generate to prevent that steel anchor from getting yanked out of the ground by that structural force. Here's a shot of what those looked like uh, after the anchors were installed, but before the cables. There's a picture of a soil, uh, you know, passive soil anchor rig doing its work. So this is an angle drilling technique. These get used for tiebacks on uh, uh, soldier pile and legging walls all the time. Uh, so that is a technique uh, that geotechnical engineers are familiar with. Just a, a little bit unusual application. Uh, so the thing that is the difference between a soil nail and like a tie back on a retaining wall is that we didn't uh, pre-tension these and lock it off like you would on a retaining wall. These resist movement through passive action, which means that if those cables try to move, there is a little bit of movement as that anchor engages with the soil and uh, resists that movement out. Uh, so something to keep in mind. Here is... Uh, a picture of the soil nail steel rod before it uh, was installed. You can see these plastic centralizers that hold it in the middle of the hole uh, before the grout is placed in. You can see the whole length is threaded, but uh, really the threads serve two purposes. One is uh, like you normally would use a thread, which is to put a nut that is providing that mechanical connection to our bearing plate. So here's our bearing plate. Here's our chair, which is welded onto the face of the beam. And then uh, there's that nut that ba bears against that bearing plate that's transferring that uh, mechanical force to our threaded rod. And then the threads also are engaging with the grout in the ground uh, to provide the lateral resistance on the other end. So this end's getting pulled out. The rod in the ground is resisting that movement by uh, trying to get pulled out of the soil. So that's cover support. 
So next I have a, a few photos showing some of this in progress. I'm gonna move through these pretty quickly because I wanna get to your questions. But the very last step in this entire process is to put that three quarter inch uh, nominal stone in place. And what you can see in this picture way at the top of the screen is actually a, a one of those shoots that, that uh, conveyor driven shoot that is actually shooting this stone out of a hopper onto the, uh, the, the slope face. You can see in this picture a little bit better uh, where that's raining down. So there are several places where uh, this was able to reach everywhere on the slope and just kind of rain that, that stone down into place. But there were also a number of places where the slope was too long and they would actually use uh, little pieces of scrap geomembrane as like a chute to uh, let that rock slide down into place. And then there would be people, you can see a rake here, workers that would go down and then rake that, that, soil, uh, that uh, stone into place. Uh, you can imagine there's a little bit of a sequence issue there, right? You don't want your workers raking the stone in at the same time as the stone is flying through the air, three quarter inch stone is gonna do some damage. So there's definitely some coordination to go uh, to be done there. Uh, so you could see there's stone being deployed over here. Uh, worker with a rake here. I'm not sure that the exact sequence that you're seeing in this slide is something that would fly uh, 20 years hence. Uh, so just wanna highlight that for you that uh, may, may need to be a modified procedure there. Here you can see the really long shoot uh, dropping that stone onto the large cut face. This is what the large cut face looked like uh, during the middle of that process. And then here is a, a picture of what the finished stone face looked like when everything was filled in. So to the you know, casual motorist, no real difference here between what you would see looking out the window on any other Pennsylvania highway and what's happening in this covered area because they use the same gray three quarter inch stone everywhere. Uh, but we know that the, the barrier layer is underneath. And in fact, uh, over time, as some of that stone uh, shifts around, occasionally you'll see bits of geoweb peeking out uh, that will occasionally get backfilled. Uh, here we are looking at uh, the grass. This is what the grass section looked like when it was done. Uh, so that's another example of the finished product. You know, the sequence on the grass was to, it's rather than shooting the stone into place, we'd spread that soil and then it would be uh, seeded in place. You know, last step in this process was to put in all the other uh, you know, safety equipment, so signage, uh, guardrails, and so on to prepare this highway for traffic. Uh, here's a picture out the window of the airplane again from one of my shots for, or one of my trips where you can see uh, that medium being prepared. You can see where there's some, actually some stone letdowns for concentrated stormwater flow on the inside of that curve. So just different things to think about. Uh, you know, we, we, we did our first design on this. We weren't counting on concentrated flow coming at us on this, this radius. And uh, that, that's something that has some pretty big implications for the stability of the slope. Uh, so again, it's not enough to, to know your own engineering. You need to be aware at least that, that stormwater can be an issue and make sure that you're engaging with the right professionals on that. Uh, here's a picture of the large buttress when it was just finished. Uh, area T54 is in the middle of getting finished. That median is done. Uh, this image right here actually made the cover on uh, conference uh, paraphernalia for several geosynthetics conferences, geotech conferences for a number of years. So um, we, we've definitely got a lot of mileage out of these images. Uh, here's a sort of a fisheye view panorama of what the large cut looks like in the middle of, of that stone placement. So you can see there's a very large area to cover. And then here it is after the highway was open to traffic and we're actually driving along with some folks to, to check out our work after the fact. Uh, it was very gratifying to see this finished. Don't always get to see the end of projects. Uh, so that was enjoyable. And then finally, my, my moonshot. So this is uh, taking an area T54 looking down the hill. It's kind of interesting with that gray stone and the long shadows. It almost looks like you're on the surface of the moon. But in fact, uh, here we are in central Pennsylvania looking at a, a nice fall day. So uh, with that, I will conclude the part where I do all the talking. And I would like to hear if you have any questions. Thank you, Kevin. Questions? Any questions? Yeah, I think the question is how, how the stone was placed and then it's answered already. Yeah, the, the stone was placed very carefully is, is what it boils down to. You know, this, uh, it was a real source of frustration for the contractor to try to figure out, you know, different different techniques in different places. The large cut was the most challenging just uh, by virtue of being the longest slope. They couldn't actually reach all the way to the middle of the slope with the stone chute. And so that's where uh, using those uh, plastic chutes to kind of slide the stone partway down the slope really came in handy. But 
the shorter slopes, they could reach all the way with the, with the stone slinger. So that was a much more viable technique elsewhere. So there is a question in the chat box. Uh, so what's a slope angle? One to two, right? So uh, there's several different ones. So this area right here, area T54, where people could walk, was uh, two horizontal or two and a half horizontal to one vertical or less. So you could walk. This one you couldn't walk. It's anywhere from one and a half horizontal to one vertical to some places near the top that were one horizontal to one vertical. Uh, when workers were working on the face in this area, they actually had to wear uh, fall protection harnesses and safety ropes that ran up to anchors at the top of slope while they were working. So it didn't appear there. They used textured gel membrane. So confirm the laboratory interface friction tests provided adequate friction against slope failure. So yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. So. This actually gets at a lot of the math behind this design. So it is a textured geomembrane. It's just kind of hard to see. Uh, so you can kind of see where the dirt is kind of working its way into the asperities on this geomembrane. Let's see if I can find a closer shot of it. Uh, you could see sort of the glossy uh, area here at the seam where we have, uh, you know, along the edges of panels, it's smooth. And then the rest of the panel, it's textured. So you can see that transition. So this is textured geomembrane. Uh, it, it wasn't like the nice uh, calendared ones like you get with the agar. This was more of the uh, sort of random pattern with the, the gas escape ones like the GSE ge geomembranes. Uh, but yeah, it was textured. And what we determined through uh, the calculations is that the interface friction through the geomembrane could provide partial support against sliding, but not complete support. And so the deficit in support was made up through the combination of the geocell and cables in the case of the slope. And that's an interesting challenge because you have uh, a strain compatibility issue here. It actually takes quite a bit of movement for that geocell to start uh, stretching and generating reaction, it takes quite a bit of deformation for those steel cables to stretch and generate reaction. And so by the time we get the full reaction force out of our stainless steel cables and our geocell, we've actually slid quite a bit of distance over that that geomembrane. And so we were using the large displacement values for interface friction for the, the frictional component of that resistance. And then we were using sort of a penalized uh, uh, resistance to sliding through the tension of the cables. So it's a great question. So you mentioned about the project, the, the issue happened, was discovered in 2003, and then you guys were called in like 2005, something like that. And then when did Finally, the construction finished. Yeah, so construction was wrapped up at the end of 2009. Uh, when this was done. So you're, you're looking at almost a 10 year process from when this project kicked off to when they actually got it to the point where uh, you could walk away from it, say that it's a complete highway project. So it was the, the local uh, division office's headache for quite a while. And there's quite a few people that retired from this project. Because you know, if there if there was no there such issue, probably the whole section of the highway was done maybe you know five years earlier. Can I That's say right. That? That's exactly right. So like the whole stretch of the interstate, other sections were done, and then this little little piece couldn't be finished because of this the environmental issue, and then they have to wait for another five years to open the whole project. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. So if I go back to my map at the beginning, my big map of Pennsylvania, you could actually see that. I can find this real quick. So you can see the dashed line here, right? So at the time that we got involved in the project, the published maps of the highway system in Pennsylvania showed this particular stretch of I-99 is under construction. But the other parts, you see I-80 where I-99 and 80 meet up and I-99 where it's on its own alignment to the south were actually completed. And what would happen is when you get to that part, there'd be some concrete barriers and you'd be directed to exit and then you'd have to continue your journey on uh, US-220 to meet up with the highway over here on the west side of State College. And that's actually where that, that this crossover right here is. So this is US 220 coming through. And then there, there is a question from the chat box. What was the final project cost? So <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a hard number to put your finger on. We know that the overall project for I-99 was something like $700 million for this stretch of highway. Of that, there is speculation that as much as 200 million was involved in the acid rock drainage remediation. 
Uh, but that's a difficult number to wheedle out because some of those those numbers are sort of intertwined with the other construction activity. The same GC was in charge of the remediation as was in charge of the highway construction. And so, uh, you know, a lot of those dollars were going to the same same destination. They did hire a specialty sub to do the, the barrier components and the, uh, the geocell components. So we have an idea of that. Uh, I, I want to say that part was on the order of like uh, 60, 70 million, something like that. So you have been down almost 13 years now. Have you had a chance to go back and see how it's performing right now? I got out there a couple of years after it was completed. I haven't been out uh, in the decades since. However, if you go on Google Map and look at it, you can see that it pretty much looks the same as what I showed in my finished picture there. There's just a few places on the, uh, the large cut where you can see that geocell kind of peeking out at the top where some stone is kind of rolled down out of the geocells a little bit. Uh, so yeah, it, it appears to be doing well. One thing that happened early on in the life of the project is that as the geocell and the cables were developing tension, they actually kind of bunched up at the toe of slope. And there are several places where uh, those protective armor sections were cut away uh, to remove that bunch at the bottom. So it's something that was anticipated by the calculations, but we got to see uh, kind of in real time what the actual uh, physical implications of that were. Has PennDOT had any problems with um, car accidents or vehicular accidents puncturing the uh, impermeable membrane? To my knowledge, they haven't. And a lot of that is because of precautions. So one of the things that PennDOT did early on was to put uh, concrete barriers at the toe of slope along here so that if a vehicle does go off, it's going to strike the barrier and not necessarily dig into that, that geocell at the toe. Uh, it isn't hard to imagine that you could get a pretty big collision that would puncture that. So I wouldn't be surprised if they have. I'm just not aware of one. And one of the things that we had to do with this project is to leave a big manual behind that explains where all the pieces are, how do you install spare parts, uh, what is required to patch the geomembrane, patch the geotextile, patch the geocell uh, in the event that future maintenance is needed. So that, that was definitely part of our mandate to provide that information. So you presented a couple of different ways to anchor them. So if you look back again, you know, what would you recommend? Do you, do you have one that you think is the most cost-effective one or they are like pretty close to each other? That's a great question. So I, I would say if you are stuck, with the solution, installing a geomembrane barrier layer on a steep slope, then that tieback that we came up with on the large cut slope is probably one of the more economical ones because those, those go in very quickly. It doesn't require a lot of material. Uh, those steel, steel beams fabricated up relatively quickly. That, that was relatively cost effective. The cast in place concrete acre uh, was very expensive and, and probably not the best. Uh, but taking a step further back, is the impermeable cover over the entire rock face the right solution? Uh, there's a lot of doubt expressed by the PennDOT project manager on this project, who I, th I think has been retired for a number of years at this point. But he had said that, in his estimation, that they were already seeing a drop off in the concentration of contaminants that were showing up in the pre treatment pond, which you can see down here, this orange pond in the lower left corner of this, uh, this screen. They're already seeing a drop off in concentration in the three years that it took to arrive at a selected uh, a remedial solution and engage us in a remedial design. And in the project manager's estimation, another perfectly viable option would have been to continue with the surface water treatment for a longer period of time and continue to watch it fall off until the point where treatment is no longer needed. And that would have avoided all of this capital costs associated with the cover. Uh, however, the politics of this project is that people were very upset to see this contaminated water. They wanted something done with it very soon. The public did not have any appetite to wait this out any longer. And so it, it wasn't solely a technical decision. It was also a political decision. Yeah, engineers, <laughs> we have to deal with those <laughs> sometimes, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, so I think that's all the questions in the chat box. What the Yeah. Any other questions from the audience here? Yeah, just grab that one and push it. So make sure it's green. 
uh when the design life is done for the project uh, and it needs to be like redone is are you gonna would you follow the same sort of procedure of just replacing the whole thing or do you think there would be another way of doing it that's a that's a great question i would say if the objective is to replace the cover probably a very similar process would be followed and we we provided all the documentation on how to do that but as i alluded in my remarks earlier if a bigger picture evaluation is taken to assess you know the remaining potential of that rock in place to leach i could very easily see a situation emerging where they they do decide to remove the cover in its entirety and allow it to attenuate over a longer period of time at this point you can imagine that that kind of decision is probably 40 years in the future um, so in the meantime they're going to continue to maintain the cover as is So there's a question, uh, did the DOT um, policy change after this you know, project because of the extra you know, time and the cost? So the policy changed to like, okay, in the future, when we do any uh, geotechnical exploration, we have to make, we have to look at not only the strengths engineering wise, but also environmental wise. So we can avoid such situations in the future. That's a great question. Uh, so I don't work with, and uh, a lot, so I don't know if their policy changed, but I do know the awareness in the department changed dramatically after this. So shortly after we worked on this project, we were actually called in to take a look at a slope along I-70 in Pittsburgh, where they had uh, this, this tar oozing out of the slope uh, because of this old manufactured gas plant that was uh, located underneath the alignment of the highway. And previously, uh, that kind of event probably wouldn't have been given much thought, uh, but after all of the bad publicity that PennDOT received for the acid rock drainage at this site, uh, the local district managers were like, we, we should probably do something about this before it becomes an issue. Let's, let's find out who we can talk to. Uh, I think ultimately they didn't end up doing a cover system for that project, so we, our participation kind of ended at that point. But uh, yet yeah, definitely as far as district personnel are concerned, there was a raised awareness as to whether that translated into policy changes or not, I can't say. So I've worked on vertical construction um, last summer for a larger uh, GC. And I know that air and vapor barriers have a sort of UV shelf life um, where they can only sit in like a UV exposed setting for 12 months, did your impermeable barriers or any of your geotextiles have uh, such a UV half-life or shelf life? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So let me switch back to this. I know you said that the geotextiles, uh, it took them, for like the geo cells, it took them like two years to install some of those. So the impermeable layers would have been sitting exposed for a while. Yeah, that's a great point. So let me, let me switch back to this image. So uh, the non-woven geotextile has a relatively short exposure lifetime. So you, if you leave this out uh, in the sun, it will begin to lose strength. And in some cases, severe cases with prolonged UV exposure actually turn into powder. And so the non-woven geotextile definitely has that shelf life. The manufacturers don't like to see it out in the sun for more than 30 days. Uh, the real number varies depending on where you're located, you know, how much solar irradiance you get. Uh, how intense the, the UV light is during that time. Uh, but yeah, geotextile definitely has that, that problem. Uh, geomembrane does not. Uh, because it has a contiguous uh, sort of molecular chain over the surface, you almost end up with what I'll call a sacrificial layer of polymer at the surface that takes the hit for the, the UV. But there's been a lot of studies done on this to show that that UV doesn't penetrate more than a, a tiny bit into that plastic. And so it doesn't change the bulk properties of the geomembrane. And in fact, uh, the Geosynthetic Research Institute has had under intense UV light a sample of an older formulation geomembrane that's been in place for decades and uh, it's been a constant high intensity UV exposure and is still chugging along showing a pretty good fraction of its strength even under that kind of UV light and keep in mind that this got covered uh, within months after that so the, the thing that you brought up the shelf life of geotextiles is actually why to go back to my, my snowy picture here. This is why between seasons, we had the geomembrane exposed at the surface and not the geotextile so that we wouldn't have that contiguous exposure. So as soon as that top geotextile cushion layer went down, that's when the clock started ticking where the geoweb had to get in place and the stone had to be placed. 
All right. Okay. So, uh, six oh six. So, how about this? I will first officially close the presentation. So, so those who have other things to do, feel free. Uh, let's uh, thank our speaker again. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. It's a pleasure to speak with you today, even though it's remote. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, if you have any other questions, I will stop recording right now and then you feel free to ask more questions if you need to.